We have data from many countries, even when kids arrive at primary school, when they walk through the door, Mm. the poorest kids are already way behind in terms of vocabulary and reading skills. And part of that is because they have less access to that cognitive development at home. And so if we can complement that environment outside of the home, then that can get those kids prepared for those first years in school so they're not already playing catch up. Welcome to Vox Dev Talks. My name is Tim Phillips. Does the provision of public daycare for infants benefit their families or the little ones themselves? And how? The evidence from previous studies, well, that's been mixed, but new research from Brazil offers some important insights into what the impact may be, how long it lasts, and who benefits. David Evans of the Centre for Global Development and Licia Lima of Fundação Getúlio Vargas at São Paulo School of Economics are two of many, many researchers with their names on this paper. Paper we're going to be talking about today. They join me now. Licia, welcome. Thank you so much, Tim. And David, welcome as well. Thank you for having us. Licia, in a a middle-income country like Brazil then this kind of daycare that we're talking about today is three years and below, I think. How common is it? It's actually quite common. Public daycare is available, at least to some degree, in many developing countries. When you look at Latin America, there's some data that shows that families that use some sort of daycare, they use most often public daycare. But of course, I mean, if you look throughout time, these numbers Mm will change rapidly. Like if you say in Brazil, the proportion of kids that used daycare doubled between 2000 and 2010. So these numbers have risen throughout time and they continue to rise. And historically, there's, you know, nevertheless, these numbers are rising and there's always more people wanting to put the children in their care than there are slots, vacancies available. So for those who are unlucky and they don't have their kids in daycare. Who is taking care of these young children? Is it always the mother? Well, parent okay is the most common. So it is mostly the mother, but it's not always the case. So there's many situations in which all the siblings, as well as grandmothers, they do their job of taking care of the children while mothers go to work. There's also some sort of a community arrangement that different communities create to take care of different kids in that community. So sometimes one mother will take care of many different children of different families while the other mother goes to work. Dave, we have only just spoken to Miguel Talamos about a similar topic. We were talking about the gender gap in the labor market in Mexico. I asked him for policy solutions to this. The first thing he said was more daycare. In theory, is this the main argument for why the government should be providing daycare for young kids? Well, Tim, that's certainly one of the reasons. In the vast majority of societies, primary responsibility for child care does fall on mothers. So providing Mm -hmm. care can make a huge difference in closing those gender gaps. But we also have evidence on the value of early childhood development interventions for children and giving them a a step ahead in those early years. So if daycare programs can be structured to provide cognitive stimulation, good nutrition, and healthy interactions with peers and providers, then they may be good for the children as well. Tell me a little bit more about what the previous research has told us about how the families and the kids might benefit from this. Well, we know that with mothers working, families have more income. So for poor children in poor countries, that income can make a huge difference for the whole family, including for these young children. So on the one hand, they're not spending as much time with their mom. But on the other hand, the household has more resources to invest in their health, in their education, in their well-being. And second, the second channel really depends on what access to nutrition and cognitive stimulation that children have in the absence of daycare and in environments where children may have irregular access to Mm. healthy nutrition or where they may not have lots of opportunities for stimulation or socialization with other kids, then high quality daycare can give children opportunities to develop. But is it all good news on this? Some of the research has shown that there might be some bad outcomes to daycare as well. 
So in some contexts, we have seen evidence of negative impacts Mm. on children's behavior, sometimes on their health. Obviously, the relationship between children and their parents is really important at early ages especially. Many of the cases where we've seen negative impacts have been in high-income countries where if children aren't in public daycare, then they're probably in some pretty high-quality alternative childcare arrangements. (laughs) Maybe parents are hiring a nanny, or maybe they've got some sort of sharing arrangement or a private daycare. That's not the case in many low-income contexts, especially with the poorest households in middle-income and low-income countries where providing daycare, a relatively high-quality daycare, may actually give children new opportunities. Okay, Licia, let's talk about our story today. This all starts off in... Rio de Janeiro in uh, 2007, doesn't it? So what happened at that time? Actually, historically, there had been more children whose parents wanted to put them in daycare than there were actually available openings. Mm. There's no slots for everyone. And this has been historically the case in Brazil and there had been historically the case in Rio de Janeiro. What happened was that before 2007, the actual criteria for assignment for choosing who got the slots was not very clear. Actually, it varied. It was more up to the directors, each daycare center director's choice and criteria to decide their own process, who would get it and who would not get it. So back in 2007, we saw an opportunity to use the lottery to assign the placements in that context. And this was actually a good idea because it is a a transparent and a fair criteria that would give everyone the same chance to participate. And also that would actually give us an opportunity to learn from a randomized control trial. So we talked to the local government back then. They agreed. They thought it was a good idea. They agreed with the design. And this is how we started the project. So we had back then, there was around 400,000 children around that age that were actually the eligible age, but then there were only around 12,000 slots. So Mm -hmm. around 25,000 families applied for their children to enter daycare. And we distributed through the lottery, you know, around 12,000, a little bit less because there were some children that actually got in because they had vulnerable status. Say they got in without entering the lottery, but most vacancies were distributed through a lottery. So outside of those kids who were assigned to daycare because of their vulnerable status. The rest of it was randomly assigned. Yes. So we had, so there were around 25,000 yeah. children applying to around 12,000 slots. The lottery is actually used to distribute around 10,000 vacancies among around 24,000 applicants. The difference is children with special needs or extremely vulnerable situation, which automatically granted the slot. So the majority was through a lottery, yes. Random assignment, there are development economists everywhere just punching the air right now. The (laughs) amount of data that you've got, that's enough that you can make some pretty firm conclusions on what you find out from it. Yes, absolutely. This was a large study and was a a large experiment. We carry out the study with a sample of children who participated in the lottery. We didn't need everyone, but we had just over 4,000 children for participating Mm. in the actual study. And this is more than enough. This gives us statistical power to identify different effects and different outcomes, not only for children, but also for other members of the household. And those of you who had the job making sense of the data, you looked at it initially after one year in 2008. Now, we said that there have been previous studies showing that the impact on children's development, their cognition could go either way. Was there a negative or a positive impact there? Great question, Tim. So in the first year, we actually focused on outcomes for other members of the household. But here's what we saw. Mm. Mothers' stress levels dropped dramatically. Parents were more likely to be reading to their children, even though they were spending less time with them since the child was in daycare. Yeah. So giving moms a break may have actually given them the space to be more active parents when they were home with their kids. 
In terms of the kids themselves, we did look a little bit later at what was happening with the kids. What we see are modest positive impacts on child development and no changes at all in children's behavior. Mm -hmm. This is really good news. Children's behavior is one of the areas where we've seen negative impacts in some of these studies in high-income countries. So the fact that moving kids into daycare doesn't have a negative impact on their behavior is really good news, especially when complemented with these positive impacts on child development. And did it pass the Miguel test by sending the kids to daycare, did the mothers end up more likely to be working? This was a real surprise coming out of this research. Most women in our sample were already working. So we don't actually see much change in Ah, mothers working, but we do see a big change in grandparents working. (laughs) That jumped from 50% in the households where kids lost the lottery to 70% in the treatment group. So it's an enormous jump. We also see older siblings who are near adult age who had likely been providing care were also more likely to be working. So a lot of times in these studies where we focus on what's happening to the mothers, we actually may be missing what's happened to women's labor force participation beyond mothers in the household, like grandmothers. I see that is really interesting because it turns the conversation we have with Miguel on its head because his analysis was about what happened when the grandmother wasn't around to take care of the kids and did the mother then work or not. I hadn't occurred to me at all to be thinking about what happens if the mother's already working and has no choice. Do the grandparents want to work and they can't? Alicia, the children were also given meals when they were in daycare as well. Did this make a difference to them? Yes, Tim, very much. Actually, one of the striking findings of our research was this very significant large and sustained effect in height and weight. Our paper suggests that the meals provided in daycare, they actually did make a difference and they were a major source of that. One important note is that the intervention in Rio was a very well-structured intervention in the nutrition dimension. So children were fed five meals a day and they had a menu that was developed by a nutrition specialist. This was interesting because people don't often think of a daycare as a nutrition intervention. Also, some of the dimensions that we looked like, you know, an opportunity to provide cognitive stimulation and also free up other members of the household to work. So these are some dimensions that were not usually thought about when people think of daycares. But our results actually show that it can function on all these levels. Well, this is pretty encouraging after a year. And the breadth of your analysis has come up with some really interesting insights. That is one of these long run studies. And you followed this up after I think it was four and seven years, wasn't it, Lizia? Did you show that these impacts were sustained? It depends on on the impact. It depends on the dimension. Mm-hmm. So like I said, impacts on, on height and weight, they were sustained even seven years after the winning the daycare lottery, which we thought was very surprising, mm-hmm. but very positive. Several of other facts that we found initially significant, such as labor force participation, uh, quality of home environments, and children cognitive development, they do last four years, but then seven years later, they do fade out. So when both kids who won the lottery and those who lost the lottery have entered primary school, we don't see impacts on these dimensions anymore. So we do see some enduring effects and in other areas we see improvements during uh, what it is uh, an actual very crucial period of child development. So Dave, let's put this in a bit of context. This intervention occurred in a middle-income country and Brazil has a particular social structure, a particular set of institutions. If this was tried in a low-income country or outside Latin America, for example, would you be expecting to see similar results? It's a crucial question, Tim. Mm. We always have to be cautious when we're taking findings from one setting to another. There are a few reasons that I'm optimistic that what we learn here does have relevance elsewhere. So this is a program implemented at scale through government programs, so it doesn't rely on a highly motivated staff from some non-government organization. Also, because Brazil's an upper-middle-income country, and we still see these impacts, I'd expect that children in lower-income environments would potentially benefit even more from 
regular nutrition, cognitive stimulation. The big area to keep an eye on is quality of the daycare. Yeah. Even though these are public daycare centers, they're clean, they're well run, they're carefully regulated and supervised. I'd be much more cautious in an environment where the government, for example, lacks the capacity to do that regulation and supervision. So that's the key thing I would take a look at as I thought about transferring these findings to a new setting. Well, one place you might expect to have good quality daycare is in high income countries where a lot of the previous research has been done. As we mentioned previously, that research hasn't tended to come down so positively in favour of daycare. Is it, as you said earlier, that's just because the, the outside alternatives are so much better for kids? I think that's right. This is why it can be so tricky to transfer good research findings from yeah. a high-income environment to another environment, right? Kids in high-income countries just have much better alternative arrangements that parents put their children in. We have data from many countries, even when kids arrive at primary school, when they walk through the door, mm. the poorest kids are already way behind in terms of vocabulary and reading skills. And part of that is because they have less access to that cognitive development at home. And so if we can complement that environment for kids in the most vulnerable households with opportunities to interact with well-trained caregivers outside of the home, then that can get those kids prepared for those first years in school so they're not already playing catch up. This is a great news story, but it's a news story that's now historical. And a lot of countries have had a lot of pressure on their social programs, certainly in the last few years after COVID. In Brazil, this has been a topic of a lot of controversy, a lot of news. Are these programs being maintained? Because as you say, demand outstrips supply. Yes, most definitely. Public daycares are alive and thriving in Brazil. Actually, it's an old intervention. It's a public policy that is mm. established. The issue is there's always demand for expansion, and it is an expensive intervention. So the good news here with our study is that we do provide evidence of several dimensions in which daycare benefits the population, not only the kids. So hopefully this is evidence to inform subsequent government decisions on whether they should allocate more funds to this. So hopefully that will be the case because there's definitely always more demand, more people demanding the service than there are slots. We joked earlier on about how it's great news, the random assignment by lottery. If you're going to be doing the evaluation, it's not great news if you're the parents and especially not if you're the kids, is it? As demand still continues to outstrip supply. Is there a fairer way of allocating daycare? It's a great question, Tim. I think for me, the real issue is what is the alternative? So before this lottery was introduced, in Rio, daycare slots were allocated at the discretion of the director of the daycare center. And I'm sure in some cases that was, you know, allocated purely because of, you know, the child was the most vulnerable. But in other cases, you know, relationships may have come to bear. Parents who are more effective at advocating their case, which may or may not be the parents who have the greatest needs, none of those are as transparent as a lottery. And they're mm. not as equal an opportunity across children. So I would propose that after giving priority to children with the very greatest needs, which Rio de Janeiro did in this case, yeah. a lottery can actually be one of the fairest ways to allocate a public service amongst people who all have significant needs. Yes, because kids don't have a choice into which parents they've got or what situation they're born into as well. Exactly. Yeah. So, Dave, this has been a long piece of work for you. You must have learned a lot along the way. Do you have advice for policymakers in other countries as to how they look at their provision of daycare? Also, how they evaluate whether or not it's doing good and in what dimensions it's doing good? Those are great questions. In terms of how to provide daycare, I would say between this evidence and the evidence we have from other contexts, we know that the daycare that works best for allowing parents to work, so the daycare that can help close those gender gaps, is daycare that's long enough that parents can actually go to work, right? It's mm. not a two or three hour daycare. Rio's public daycare was a full day, so a parent could actually go and work a shift at a job or a grandparent. The daycare that works best for children, 
includes high quality interactions with staff and peers, cognitive stimulation, and consistent nutrition. And in this study, we see the long-term impacts of that consistent nutrition. In terms of how to evaluate these programs, obviously, when there is more demand than there are openings, then a lottery can provide a fair way to allocate vacancies and also an opportunity to evaluate. I'm really looking forward to seeing more research where countries experiment with how to improve that quality. And the last piece of advice I'd give, like you said, this has been a long process. And the reason we have such a a wonderful and large team of authors is because over time, different people have brought different areas of expertise to the evaluation. So the last advice is really to keep at it. And uh, a lot of learning can take place if uh, we can be diligent and keep trying our best to improve public services for the most vulnerable members of our populations. Well, I hope we see a lot more research on these topics because it's it's not just important, it's incredibly interesting and insightful. So thank you very much for talking about it, Dave. Thank you so much, Tim. And Licia, thank you as well. Thank you very much, Tim. The paper is called Public Child Care Labour Market Outcomes of Caregivers and Child Development Experimental Evidence from Brazil. If you want to find it as an NBER working paper, it is working paper 30653. The wonderful team of authors, deep breath. We have Orazio Atanasio, Ricardo Paes de Barros, Pedro Carneiro, David Evans, Licia Lima, Pedro Olinto, and Norbert Shadi. This has been a Vox Dev Talk, the best way to make sure you don't miss an episode. Well, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. You'll find us there. If you do miss an episode, then you can always go to voxdev.org, where you will find it. You will also find articles about the papers we feature.